الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين يبايعونك إنما يبايعون الله يد الله فوق أيديهم فمن نكث فإنما ينكث على نفسه ومن أوفى بما عاهد عليه الله فسيؤتيه أجرا عظيما وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم اليد العليا خير من اليد السفلى أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, sisters, I thought I'd commence my presentation today with an incident that had happened to a particular scholar who was busy engaged preparing his Friday sermon and his little son was interrupting him. Sometimes it could be a bit of a nuisance when you try to get undivided attention and something is irritating or someone is bothering you. So he decided to constructively engage his son. One is unfortunately you put him before some TV show and let him sit there and watch and then the scientific research will tell you regarding the harm he creates to the memory faculty and so on and so forth. His gaze fell on a little map, map of the world. So he made it into bits and pieces and he said, wow, here's a nice puzzle. Let me give it to the little boy. He can busy put the pieces together and by that time I'll be back from my Friday prayers. Gave it to the boy and in 10 minutes he put the world together. The dad is absolutely puzzled, perplexed. But how did you know where's Africa and Asia and where's Antarctica and how did you put these continents together? He says, dad look on the reverse side. On the reverse side was the image of a human. He just put the heads and the legs, the legs and the hands and the head together and the world came together. When the dad seen this, he says, you know what, my son, today you have given me a topic. If man is in order, the world comes in place. If the human being is in order, it's as simple as putting him in place and the entire world comes together. The poet says, how wrong of you to say that times have changed and things have evolved. The times are the same, the world is the same, it's the human that has changed. Now, while undoubtedly this particular event has left me green with envy, and I salute and compliment the, the organizers of this particular movement, and I hope it can go from strength to strength, and with Australia, I guess you can add South Africa also, there's a new country to initiate it. Because inshallah, I will definitely take the concept home. How do we, in this limited time of ours, conclude and wrap up the events of one week on a constructive note, thereby making a difference to those on planet Earth? Let's first identify some crises we are facing in the society. One of the key problems today that we are facing is that the youth do not know where they belong. In Islam, we have one of two phases. Either you're a child, meaning you're not physically matured, and you enjoy all the privileges of love, tenderness, compassion, and pampering, to the extent that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, alayhi salatu min Allahi wa taslimat, picked up a little child. Apologies for this. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, picked up a little child and he hugged him and embraced him. There was a Bedouin there who found the practice to be quite strange. And he said, Atuqabbiluna sibiyanakum ya Rasulullah. O Prophet of Allah, does your Islam advocate embracing little ones? He says, undoubtedly it's part of my faith. So the Bedouin said, Inna li ashratan min al I have ten sons and I haven't kissed one. The Prophet وسلم, said, what can I do if the element of kindness has been snatched from your heart? So in Islam, either you're a child, male or female, and you enjoy the privileges that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
would often humble himself to the point that he would take his grandchildren on his back and he would ride them around. Or then you're an adult and you assume responsibilities like any other adult and the laws of Islam apply to you and you're held accountable for the wrongs you do. But there is no window period and there is no in-between phase which unfortunately has caused the havoc in the world that we see today. So we have a segment of our society who are too old to be young. Too old to be young. So we can't pamper them and we can't passionately hug them because they're no longer children. They have obviously grown up. Islam views them old enough to assume responsibility but society says they're too young to assume responsibility. So we have this window period where they're not children, nor adults and this has caused havoc on the earth. Because they are moving around aimlessly without identifying a goal and a platform. Number two, the second issue that we are facing in society. Unfortunately, many of the youth today are being exposed to slogans, and I'm not generalizing, but by and large. What is a young boy being told from time to time, or a young sister, at the age of 13, this is your right. By 15, you demand it. By 18, you institute legal action. By 20, you can sue for defamation. So these are the typical slogans that have been exposed or been thrown before the young man growing up. Hence, he grows up with expectation from his seniors. My dad has denied me this. My mom has never given me this. My brother owes me this. Society has failed me here. Now, if we view the same scenario from an Islamic perspective, he or she will be told, at the age you physically mature as a young boy, you no longer the duty of your dad to support you. It's now his kindness. Once you're of age, that's the loyalty you owe to your neighbor. Once you're of age of earning, relieve your dad from supporting you. So he is reminded of the duties he owes to others in relation to what others owe to him. If we just reverse that, if we just reverse that, then you know what a difference it will make to society. And that brings me to the third dilemma that we face. Everything has become so monetary related that I'm afraid the dominant factor in pursuing an academic degree without generalizing because there are always exceptions is the monetary return. So I might pursue medication and science or medicine or whatever it is. There might be an element of compassion to serve humanity. But the dominant overriding overwhelming factor is that in which I can secure maximum revenue. I might have a legal minded, legal eagles as they say. You know this person went to a particular lawyer and they asked him, what's your legal fees? He says, well, it's 200 pounds for three questions. He says, but isn't that expensive? He says, undoubtedly, what's your third question? <laughs> so I'm afraid the biggest religion today has not been the following of the Prophet, Jesus, peace be upon him, or the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But it is as in P-R-O-F-I-T and not P-R-O-P-H-E-T. It's not prophets, but it's this. It's this prophets. And I hope and I pray that I will get together here today with a noble agenda like this as the forerunner of the event under the umbrella of which we've been united. Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahumullah said, قَدْ مَاتَ قَوْمٌ وَمَا مَاتَتْ مَكَرِمُهُمْ he says, many people have died a physical death, but their noble character has kept them alive even after their death. And many people are physically alive, but the evil has killed them while they reside on this earth. So the choice I throw to the floor today is to you, my brothers and sisters. Either you wish to be revered in the years to come after your physical demise or society refers to you as a liability even while you are alive. What better agenda than to start off on the drive of, of collecting funds? 
It brings me to the couplets of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu who said, فَحْذَرْ يَا زَوَالَ فَحْذَرْ زَوَالَ الْفَضْلِ يَا جَابِرْ وَأَعْطِ مِنْ دُنْيَاكَ مَنْ سَأَلَهَا فَإِنَّ ذَا الْعَرْشِ جَزِيلُ الْعَطَى يُضَقِّفُ بِالْحَبَّةِ أَمْثَالَهَا That, O oh, Jamil, I advise you, let not your wealth be destroyed by hoarding it. But the key to the multiplication of your wealth is spending on the cause of the poor and the noble and the needy. By virtue of that, Almighty will multiply your wealth. Now, I thought today, I would like to share with you an incident of a person who I believe truly epitomizes the spirit of a Muslim, both from an academic perspective as well as from a religious dimension. And I think it's paramount and it's integral that we marry the two and we amalgamate the two. While it is vital and integral and imperative that we excel on the academic front, it's equally if not more important that we reflect our identity and our image, thereby expressing the beauty of Islam and excelling on both fronts. There was a person by the name of Iyas bin Muawiyah, Iyas al-Muzani, who was amongst those who had seen the companions of the Prophet sallallahu a young, profound, dynamic youngster. He was born 46 years after the migration of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina Munawwara. It is said during the golden era, during the golden era of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, and anyone who is familiar with Islamic history will know that it's a rich era in, in, his, in the annals of Islamic history. It is known as the second Umar, where justice prevailed. So during that particular period, there was a vacancy for the judge of Basra. And that was the thing that was bothering the mind of the, the leader of the believers at that time, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. But obviously at that time, nomination did not take place where he was sworn into office and there was a bash and uh, he was inaugurated and you know what delegates from across the globe and it was televised. It was quite a simple procedure. The Prophet said, Inna lam nasta'mila ala amalina man arada. We will never appoint a position to anyone who seeks it. The world today is facing a dilemma where Africa has the poverty crisis, people living in abject poverty below the bread line, and there is hunger for food, and those in the developed nations are hungry for power. So power in essence has crippled the world. Some are hungry for food, and I'm afraid in my personal analogy perhaps you differ with me, the hunger for food might drive a man to steal, but the hunger for position will drive a man to kill. And I hope and I pray that those who graduate from this university as academics come out with a different flavor in the world. We've seen many like you graduate with the mind of securing more finance and making an extra buck and elevating their own position. But we hope they can bring a new light to the crisis in the world. And I have no doubt if this is what you can achieve in a short span of five years, then indeed your ambitions and your aspirations are noble and your vision, if it materializes, would be equally noble. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz spends the night restless. Bata Amir al Mu'mineen Umar ibn Abdul Aziz Layla Tabu Tilka Ariqan Musahadan Lam Yakta Midlahu Jafnun Walam Yatma Inna Lahu Kalbun Whole night tossing and turning. Who do I appoint as the judge? Who do I appoint as the judge of Basra? After much application of his mind, he said, I know of two people. Walaqad Waqa'a Ikhtiyaru Ma'ala Rajulain Ithnaini People who are noble, who have impeccable character, who are sound in their knowledge, who are noble in their integrity, people who will really be exemplary to humanity. I mean, what a crisis we are facing when it comes to celebrities' private life. What contradicting sentiments are coming down? Like it or not, 
every celebrity is idolized across the globe. That's the, that's the, that's the manner in which we are living and that's the inevitable inclination of the youth. The only human whose life was perfected on all fronts was the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, I'm afraid you will find, and obviously the galaxy of prophets in its entirety, they were divinely molded by the Almighty and hence they were exemplary. Otherwise, you will find a man who is a phenomenal businessman, but ask his wife, he's a terrible husband. You know, on a lighter note, this husband, every time he throws his tantrums, he finds his wife is very calm and composed. I'm not giving ideas, obviously. <laughs> so one day he asked his wife, he says, you've got, you know what, we need to have some anger management tips from you. When you control yourself and you compose yourself very well, how do you do this? Every time I vent my frustration and I lose my cool and you're very calm. She says, no, I just go clean the toilet. How does cleaning the toilet calm your anger? I do so with your toothbrush. <laughs> Sound in their integrity, profound in their knowledge. We want people that are wholesome to come out in society. Imagine if we start having more pleasant people at our airports, people that are more accommodating, People that are more receptive. Just imagine what, you know, the brother was speaking about the importance of smiling. I had a beautiful saying once I was traveling in, I guess it was Singapore. And they had some, sometimes we ignore these saints, but sometimes these saints are great. And you know what, they could be psychologically have great implications. They say when you are angry, you're exerting more facial muscles than when you smile. So it's cheaper to smile. It is cheaper to smile, and that's the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. The noble companion said, Whenever I seen him, he had a broad smile on his blessed face. So, anyway, the leader, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, decided that one of two people, one is Iyas ibn Muawiyah al Muzani, or Qasim ibn al Rabi'ah, he says, I'm going to appoint one of these two people. So, he addressed his governor. That was Ali ibn Al-Qat. He said, Oh Ali, Ijma' bayna Iyas ibn Muawiyah wal Qasim ibn Rabi'at al-Harithi. Do me a favor that gather these two people and I want to sit them down and we need one of them to take the post. We need one of them to take the post. There is a vacancy and that is the judge of Basra. This, this position needs to be occupied. So he said, Sam'an wa ta'atan ya amir al-mu'mineen. It's a done deal. Take it as done. The next morning he gathers these two gentlemen and he says, I need to talk to you, man. I need to speak to you people. I have some important work with you. In Amir al Mu'minin, Aqal Allah Baqa Abu Amarani and Uwandi Ahadakuma Qada al Basra. I have been deputed with the task that one of you have to become the judge. Now, I really don't know where your positions would lead you to, but I hope and I'm optimistic that as you qualify in your different spheres and you climb the ladder, you could perhaps become the dean of the faculty in that particular institution. Understand your position. And appreciate the responsibility that comes along with it. So I want one of you to accept the post, a senior post like this. What was the answer? Famada Tarayan, how do you view this year? They both said, Fakala kullu minhuma an sahibihi and nahu awla minhu bihad al bansa. Listen, I respect your sentiments and thanks for your kind thoughts about me. But I promise you, my brother on my right, he is the best person you're looking for. And he says, my brother on my left, there's no, look no further. Look no further. But just look at the difference already, if that's the viewpoint, that I'm ready to forfeit, forego, and present to someone else. Someone else can come forward and do a better job. The Prophet said, whenever anyone seeks it, then he will be deprived of divine aid. Hence in Islam there isn't campaigning. And each one of them started speaking about the outstanding qualities. He's so noble, he's so virtuous, he's so righteous, he's so you know, loyal, he's so faithful. And the list continues. Ali ibn al-Qad said, لَن تَخْرُجَ مِن مَجْلِسِ هَذَا حَتَّى تَحْسِمَ هَذَا الْأَمْرُ None of you walks out of here until this issue is not resolved. So then, 
Now we are shrewd and we are cunning and we manipulate it and we slide, but so that we can make it for ourselves. Today, you know, it's very easy. Any problem you have, just add the word syndrome next to it and it becomes a medical condition. <laughs> Any problem you have. One youngster came to me and said, Chef, I have a middle child syndrome problem. I said, now simplify. He said, well, you know what? My eldest brother got the attention. My youngest brother gets all the love and I suffer a middle child syndrome. <laughs> I mean, this medical world is just pulling us and dragging us. And then you'll have a therapist to counter the syndrome. And where, where, where does it end? So anyway, Iyas ibn Muawiyah says, since he, you cannot resolve it, Sal anni wa anil qasim al faqihi al iraq Muhammad ibn Sirin wal Hassan al Basri, fahuma aqdar al nasi ala al tamizi baynana. Did you want to depute me or my fellow brother here? I have a suggestion to you. In Basra, there are two profound scholars, eminent, renowned scholars, the likes of Muhammad bin Sirin and Hassan Basri. Those who are familiar with history will understand the rich contribution they have made in Islam. Why don't we approach them and whatever their view is, we take it as final. After all, they are high profile people. Now, the, the wisdom of this particular man, Iyas, was he deliberately made reference to those scholars with whom his colleague was affiliated. He deliberately, selectively. Now, typically, if we have an argument and I present with my scholar, well, that's your scholar, I have a different opinion. I don't agree with him. I'll call my scholar. And then we got the scholars arguing. He deliberately selected those people with whom his colleague was affiliated and he knew, obviously, وَكَانَ الْقَاسِمُ يَزُورَانِهِ يَزُورُهُمَا وَيَزُورَانِهِ That when they affiliated with him, they'll speak positive about him and they'll say, no, no, make him the leader. So when Qasim heard his friend going to the extra mile that I must take on the position, understanding the responsibility that it brings along with, he said, we're going to go and call him and ask him his opinion. Let me tell it to you in a nutshell and wrap it up and then you make the decision. He said, لا تسأل عني ولا عنه أحد فوالله الذي لا إله غيره إن إياسا أفقه مني في دين الله وأعلم بالقضاء فإن كنت كاذبا فما يحل لك أن توليني القضاء وأنا كاذب وإن كنت صادقا فما يجوز لك أن تعذر عن الفاضل إلى المفضول. I swear by Allah his control is my life. My colleague here excels me by far. If I'm a liar in my oath, then how dare you make a liar a judge? If I'm lying in what I'm saying positive about him, then that tells you enough about my character. And if I'm speaking the truth, then do the right move and make the noble one the leader. In other words, going to that extent, imagine if that had to become the political layout of the world today. Just imagine if we wouldn't have this rivalry, and I won't even call them rivals because they were not fighting. I mean, I don't have to tell you, you are familiar with the media and you hear the political unfolding developments that are happening. It's Forever there is campaigning, there is rivalry. But imagine if this was the atmosphere outside in the world, how much more conducive this earth would have been. So what does Iyas ibn Muawiyah say? He says, Inna kajihta bi rajulin wa ta'awtahu ila al-qaha fa'awqaftahu ala shafeer jahannam fanajja nafsahu minha bi yameenin kahiba la yalbath an yastaghfir allaha minha wa yadju nafsahu mimma yalha. Let me wrap it up and say to you, O leader, you brought my colleague and you have put upon him the responsibility of becoming the judge, which in my eyes is tantamount to putting him on the edge of hell. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ has said about the grave consequences of a man who's in position and abuses his position, who exploits his position in any form of authority. Luqman Hakim told his son, إِذَا دَعَتْكَ قُدْرَتُكَ عَلَىٰ ظُلْمِ النَّاسِ فَتَذَكَّرْ قُدْرَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Oh my young son, when your authority provokes you to abuse and exploit, then constantly remind yourself of the supremacy and the authority that Allah has over you. Imagine if we could just have this in every office, just in front of you and it reminds you every time. When your authority provokes you to abuse and to exploit, we all know about Luqman Hakim. 
He was such a phenomenal human. The Quran devotes a chapter to his advisors. Someone once asked him, from where did you acquire wisdom? And the most brilliant answer you've ever heard, or perhaps you've never heard, is what Luqman gave. He said, I learned wisdom from those who lack it. Where did you get all the wisdom from? I'm an Oxford graduate. Oh. No, no. I learned it from the dropouts of life. I learned it from those who lack it. And how's that? He said, every time I seen someone do something wrong, which was despicable and detestable, I said, these are the actions I must avoid. Avoiding the blunders of others made me the wise of man. Now I'm afraid we look at the wrong of others with the eye, with the critical eye and the condemning eye. So, forgive the metaphor. Forgive the metaphor with no offense. Today she's moaning of her mother-in-law. Only to know the day she becomes a mother-in-law, she repeats the same. Why? Because it's not with the eye of learning. So he says that you've called my brother and you've put him on the edge of hell and he has sneaked out of this equation with a false oath. When Ali ibn Atat heard this, he said, Inna man yafham mithla fahmika hadha la jadeerun bil qada haliyun bihir. A man like you, O Iyas, with such integrity, such wisdom, and really declining from the position, you are a youngster that will make a difference to society. And he crowned him and he made him the judge. Now, imagine when a young man like this, who really has the, the fear of the Almighty, and that's what I believe. The only thing that can bring stability to society is the consciousness of the Almighty. We're facing a crisis of who will guard the guardians, police, the police. So authority will bring a degree of stability. I can enforce, I can impose, I can compel. But the question goes beyond who polices the police, who guards the guardians. And again it boils down to the same things, the consciousness of the Almighty. That's the only thing in the privacy of your house that will save you from abusing. This girl wanted to get married to a very profound, articulate young boy. So the dad was a bit skeptical. And uh, she says, no, the dad is brilliant man, he's phenomenal, he's wow, he's wealthy. The old man, after all, wisdom comes with age. He says, my daughter, if he loves you, like what happened in the beginning, then all these talents and skills will be in your favor. But the day things go wrong, then all his contacts and his skills go against you. If he's an ordinary person, he won't, he won't have a legal docket against you. But if he's a lawyer, then he will sue, because he knows the law in and out. As long as he loves you, all that laws will be in your favor. But the day there is a problem in the marriage which is bound to happen and is the nature of marriage, then I'm afraid these very talents of his will be instituted against you. So that's the first humble message that if I may put, as I tie it up with my opening sentiments, that the motivating factor of the passion of, of the study that we have should not be the monetary return. Undoubtedly, we need to secure returns. But as, as humans, we need to look beyond and above then only we'll be making a difference to society. I don't think, I don't say run a free practice and run a free clinic. We have to charge in moderation. It is said about this young boy, he was studying, and I want to highlight this in particular, and I wish I had seen more non-Muslim faces, just so that we can merge this gap and show and explain our coexistence with harmony. We can learn to respect the differences of others and live with dignity. And that is undoubtedly the teachings of the Prophet And like that brother from Australia said, and via technology we echo his sentiments, that undoubtedly the endeavor that you have started here will undo the stereotype. This particular youngster, Iyas, Ruiya anna hu kana yata'allam fi kuntabin li rajulim bin ahli al-dhimma, he was attending a non-Muslim university. Wa kana yata'allam al-hisab, and he was studying maths and accounting. 
You know, they say these youngsters were sailing on a little boat and with them was an old man. And our old age, traditional, cultural, doesn't know much, and is just living his basic life. And then one of the youngsters steps the old man and he says, Uncle, you heard about mathematics? What are you talking, my boy? Nothing. Flies beyond me. The next one says, Uncle, have you ever studied astronomy? Nothing. Uncle, you know anything about physics? Nothing. Anyway, just then they realized there was a bit of a strong wave and there was a tide and the boat was about to dirt. The uncle says, boys, you know swimmonology. <laughs> boys, you know swimmonology? Because that's what you need here. We have a crisis in society where we need to integrate the seniors with the juniors. Unfortunately, we're just getting alienated. The youth are not showing the correct amount of respect and I'm afraid the seniors without those respect are not embracing. And we're having two distinguished fractions in society, two distinguished groups. We need to develop that mechanism through which we can amalgamate it and we can unite it and tie it up. So anyway, this youngster was studying in this university and he was doing his thing. He was perhaps the odd Muslim in that particular university. We know how the profiling is happening today. So one day, the teacher was having a debate with the students on one aspect of faith, which could typically happen. And with the media today, something could happen in another part of the world. Immediately, it would have ripple effects. And every person of the concerned faith would be put into the questioning box and he would be asked and he would be scrutinized. So, The students gather around the teacher and the teacher poses a question and he says, Very strange, I read about the Muslims. Perhaps if you heard, I don't know if you read the article, I don't know if you've seen last night's news, those are the slogans. Anyway, I came across an article that suggests that Muslims believe that in paradise they will consume, they will eat, they will drink, but they will not relieve themselves, which is against medics and it's against logic as well. Whatever you eat, you've got to somehow flush it out of the system. So all those around the teacher said, yeah, that's a great question. Never crossed my mind. I didn't know they believed that. I wonder what they'll say. So this young boy, he asked, did not go around imposing his faith. Nay, at this junction he had not even propagated his faith. But the dignity of this boy and the maturity of this boy compelled him to respond when his faith was put under attack. He did not come across in an emotional way. He did not come across in an aggressive way because that has always harmed the cause. I believe we can sit down with respect and dignity, appreciating the faith of others, the culture of others, and have healthy dialogues and agree to disagree. He said, Would you be kind enough, O oh respected teacher, to afford me the podium to respond? Look at the respect. Look at the element of respect. I was once in Australia and I wouldn't, you know, uh, mention the name of the institution. I had to address the compliment of staff and then I was taken around the school. I promise you, I was appalled. I was absolutely appalled by the level of respect. Absent, never mind respect, the absenteeism of respect. For a moment I lost my balance and I said, is this how school unfolds? Is this how we teach? Obviously, I come from an institution where respect is paramount. It's vital. It commences from there. It's the inspiration from the heart. He says, oh teacher, would you afford me the opportunity to come forward? You know, when we were in school one day, many years ago, well, not that many, I'm not so old. And anyway, the teacher asked the question, so what would you do if the president? And, uh, you know, each one goes into dream world, and then wishful thinking, 
and starts enjoying himself till he comes back to reality. And then one day the teacher said a thing which was so harmful and so detrimental. And again, we need the right teachers in the right place. What would you do if you got? So already you are creating an image in the mind of the child that I will better what is happening. Now there is a hadith of Qudsi which makes my hair stand. مَنْ لَمْ يَرْضَ عَلَىٰ قَضَائِي وَلَمْ يَسْبِرْ عَلَىٰ بَلَائِي فَلْيَتَّخِ الرَّبَّنْ سِوَائِي The Almighty says, He who cannot persevere what I put in his way, and who will not exercise happiness on what I allocate for him, then tell him to look for another deity who does a better job than I. But there was one sharp youngster there. He says, Madam, if I was God, I wouldn't have created you. <laughs> Get out of the class, you deviant delinquent. Ask me what I would have done. Be honest with you, I wouldn't have created you. That's what's going to happen to society. Imagine now, in that position of yours as a teacher, and that's what you're saying. There was a youngster who was parading the aisles of the plane, circulating pamphlets on birth control, birth control, birth control. He comes to this one old man, says, Yeah, uncle, what's your opinion? Typically expecting resistance. He says, My son, how old are you? He says, 20 years. So I wish they started 20 years ago, we wouldn't have had you here. <laughs> Where is society heading? What are the messages that have been echoed? But understand the implications. Guard your lips when a child is near. For children repeat the things they hear. Let no ugly tone be heard, no careless talk, no angry word. For it is a gracious sin to mar the innocent. Language, vulgar or unkind, leaves its mark upon the mind. Language, vulgar or unkind, leaves its mark upon the mind. So let your speech be mild, let your speech be wise and mild in the presence of a child. It leaves its indelible impression. So anyway, the young boy says, can I come forward and speak? Now again, that brings me to another point. How educated are you, my young brother, and how educated are you, my young sister? Can you, with dignity, without emotions, without offensive language, without obscene tones, can you come across in a healthy dialogue and explain your viewpoints and respect others? then I promise you there's no hostility left on planet Earth. But I'm afraid, number one, you lack knowledge. Number two, you come across with emotions. Number three, when you sit behind that microphone, you cause more harm to the religion than benefit. You're a disgrace, a disgrace better, greater than, than the benefits you bring. With dignity, he responds. And he says, oh teacher, and to the floor. أَكُلُّ مَا يُؤْكَدُ فِي الدُّنْيَا يَخْرُجُ غَائِطًا is it everything that we consume in the world that is reduced to feces and stool and, and, and urine? No. So that which we do not relieve ourselves of, where does it disappear into? It becomes nutrition to the body. If in principle you agree, portion of what we consume becomes nutrition to the system. What's so difficult to elevate it and believe that in paradise everything will become nutrition to the system? In principle and in theory, if you're in harmony with the first aspect, and you pretty much agree with me that a portion of what we consume stays within the system, and obviously it gives nutrition to us. Someone one day came to him. And he said, Ya Abba wa ila, ma taqulu fil muskir. What's your opinion on intoxicants? Alcohol. Now we all know this has crippled our society. Scientifically, you will be told, and perhaps you've read, that you know what, if you take alcohol in moderation, in a certain quantity, it benefits the mind, it strengthens the IQ, it increases the vision and the rest of it. At the onset, let me tell you, Islam is pretty much in agreement with that theory. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعٌ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا Many times during the 
lottery, what are the slogans that via the lottery so many charitable organizations benefit, so many poor? Again, Islam agrees. Look at the beauty of the Quran. Look at the comprehensive nature of the Quran. The Quran says, O Muhammad, وسلم, they asked you regarding alcohol and they asked you regarding gambling. I read an article recently of compulsive gamblers that their addiction is so great that they don't want to shift off the machine for a split second to the extent that many of these compulsive gamblers wear adult diapers. So I don't have to go to the loo for a minute. Might as well do it while I'm playing. <laughs> I have read this in the paper. Where are we heading? You, you know, you have the compulsive worker, you have the compulsive gambler. That's to the extent that they wear adult diapers. Undoubtedly there is benefit in gambling and there is benefit in alcohol. But the principle of the Quran when something is prohibited, Say unto them the harms of alcohol and gambling are far more greater than the benefits. The harms are far more greater. You might tell me that you know what Facebook has an advantage, at least you can see the profile of a person before you employ you. 8.5 million unique users. Salman Farsi said when I got married and I had my first night and I consummated the relation and I came out, my friends told me, Kay for what to Allah. So how was it? I go to the narration, فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهُمْ He turns away. Again they come, كَيْ فَوَجَدْتَ أَهْلَا So, come on Salman, talk up. فَأَعْرَضَ عَنْهُمْ He walks away. The third time, كَيْ فَوَجَدْتَ أَهْلَا Salman. He says, إِنَّمَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى السُّطُورَ وَالْأَبْوَابَ لِتُوَارَى مَا فِيهَا The reason why there's a wall and there's a door and there's a curtain is what happens inside doesn't go outside. And he says, 
says when I turn the pages and the sound of reading one book after the other is more comforting to me than all the musical instruments in the world. Which someone said, Ahlul Layli fi Laylihim, Aladdumin Ahli Lahwi fi Lahwihim. There is a fake pleasure, and that's dining in a club with a young girl on your lap and a bottle of wine in your hand. The poet says, I challenge you and I take you on. There is another pleasure in the dead of the night, awakening from your sleep, performing the ablution and bowing before your Creator. I'm ready to put my head on the block. That pleasure is true pleasure and it is absolute pleasure. Then he says, And more comforting than the melodious voice of a seductive girl as she plays the guitar, for me is to hear the Quran being recited and to understand what hadith of the Prophet and when I have adequately absorbed one aspect of religion and I've understood it, the joy with which I sway, you see when people steams win. Oh. I tell you when it was announced that South Africa will host the 2010 World Cup. Wow. People were gone literally crazy. And then anyway, I tuned in the radio and there was this, oh my God, this elderly old woman, goodness gracious me, what an event. I thought to myself, my word, you're not going to be living, man. You're not going to be living. Get on with life. وَتَمَايُلِي طَرَبًا لِحَلِّ عَوِيصَةٍ فِي الدَّرْسِ and when I accomplish and I understand something, then I sway with joy. It's more comforting to me than the most palatable of wines. I spend my night communicating with my Lord. You spend it in a club and in a pub, and you want to walk with me in paradise? You dream it. I spent my night with my Creator. And you're sleeping and you're dining and you're clubbing and you're pubbing. And you're optimistic we will walk together in paradise. So anyway, someone came to this kiyas. Now, profound knowledge to we have it. And he asked him a question, What's your opinion on intoxicants? He said, haram, forbidden. So immediately the person asking the question said, What's the wisdom of its impermissibility? When it's no more than water, grape juice, diluted with some sugar added, that's it. Individually, the ingredients are wholesome, they're nutritional, you know, and, and that's how we've just been dragged in. We know what is the extent of obesity and how much it's killing the people. And then psychologically, we appease ourselves, so we ask for a double cheesy burger, I'll have a diet coke only. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a diet, it's just give me a diet coke. A double cheesy burger, you've killed everything. So <laughs> why are you going to go? I'm afraid I, I only have diet coke. Sorry, sir. <laughs> and look at the double cheesy burger. I, I there's this, this chuckle berries. I don't know if it's here. But anyway, it's, it's, it's an outlet that is open up there. A hundred gram burger. And it's a challenge if you can eat it. And then you're going for a diet coke, you know. Where's the logic? Where are we heading? So anyway, he says, what's the wisdom? <coughs> Water, grape juice, sugar, individually all pure and wholesome. And you put it together and you said it's forbidden. Now today, my brother and my sister, you will be thrown and you'll be put in the hot seat. And you will be asked questions about your faith. I only can wish and pray and hope 
that you can groom and groom yourself with knowledge, that it can fortify you, like it fortified this young boy. He said, "Afarata min qawlika ya dhuban am baqiya ladayka ma taquluhu." Are you done, or do you want to ask more? He says, "No, I'm done." Okay, you want to yell over the radio, or you want to keep the phone up? He says, "No, I yell on the radio, but put the phone down." Okay, listen. Look at this answer. He says, "Lo akhtu kafa min ma fadharatu kabihi akan yujibu." If I sprinkle water on your face, will it hurt you? He says, "No." لو أخذت كفا من طراف فضربت كبيه أكان يوجعه. If I take sand and I scatter it on you, would it hurt you? No. لو أخذت كفا من طبن فضربت كبيه أكان يوجعه. If I take straw and I drop it on you, light straw which has no weight, would it hurt you? No. Says right. Now listen. لو أخذت طراف ثم تركت عليه الطب ثم صببت فوقه الماء ثم مزجتها مزجا ثم جعلت الكتلة في الشمس حتى يبز. ثم ضربتك به أكان توجعك قال نعم وقد تقتلني. I take that same water, I mix it with sand, and then I put straw in it. I make it into a base. I make it into a mold. I put it in the sun till it hardens, and it has the shape of a brick. And then I blast you with it. He says, would it hurt you? Hurt? It could be fatal and claim my life. He said, how can I shut your mouth when alcohol is no different? Alcohol is no different individually. وتتخذون منه سكرا ورزقا حسنا ومن ثمرات النخيل والاعناب تتخذون منه سكرا ورزقا حسنا. Allah says indeed from from the grapes you can make wholesome provision. You can use it constructively and you can abuse it and it can become harmful. So if I have the correct knowledge, look at you know when you talk of it's an all rounder. He bats, he bowls, he feels. This is an all-rounder. Then he knew how to answer the question with dignity. When it came to addressing his colleagues in school, those around him, a dilemma that was facing the Ummah during his reign was regarding the sighting of the moon, and I think that's no different to UK. You know, one brother in the US told me a brilliant thing. In California, he says, you know, Shaykh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam split the moon and united the people. Today we're splitting the moon and we're dividing the people. Or rather, we we're doing it the opposite, the other way around. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam split the moon, but he united the people. Today on the grounds of the moon, we're dividing the people. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam split the moon, we know the open miracle, but he united the people. We are dividing the people because of the moon. People came out searching for the moon. وعلى رأسهم الصحابي الجليل أنس بن مالك and the person steering the delegation and heading the delegation was the noble companion of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم رضي الله عنه وقد قارب مئة and he was close to hundred years but he was totally in sound health in sound health فنظر الناس إلى السماء فلم يروا شيئا people looked at the sky clear clear the horizon was clear there was no trace of a crescent of the moon لكن أنس بن مالك يقول ها هو ذا لقد رأيته and if the man says, no, no, but I can spot the moon, there's it, it's quite clear. Now, what a dilemma. You have an entire group, an audience of people who are not companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and you have one who is his companion, which we know in seniority outweighs everyone. Now, this particular sensitive junction, if it wasn't held, if it wasn't interacted with diplomacy and wisdom and vision, it could lend itself into internal bickering. It was so volatile that nobody else can see the moon, yet you have a senior person, the noble companion of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, I see it. So they said, let's go call that youngster, Iyas. Let's call him and come. So the young lad comes out. He says, you know, this is the dilemma. All of us look, it's quite clear. But now in our terms, what will we be? The youngster will say, hey, I don't know, let's stop him. He's not all right. Unfortunately, this man, this old man, I don't know what he's seen. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And this is again the need of integration, the respect of seniority. Because there are things we can learn, you know, on a lighter note, they say this uh, wedding took place. And I often mention, there are many answers that perhaps are married or in the process of getting married. We worry a lot about the wedding and we forget the marriage. The wedding is one day, the marriage is forever. 
You know, we worry about the event. The event is one day and it's over. Worry about the marriage day after. The woman, she sighs with relief. I gave birth to a normal healthy child. I'm over with labor pains. Undoubtedly, that's joy. But really, my sister, with the youth of today, he'll give you labor pains every day. <laughs> the challenge is not over. Far from over. Birth was undoubtedly a challenge. But what is ahead of you is the real challenge. So anyway, they got married and now you know in certain homes, customs, traditions that uh, when the boys party arrived then they would play a trick on them and lock the door till you give us 500 pounds, then only will allow our daughter out and whatever else. So they laid out the table and what they did was they put long sticks on the hands of everyone. And the condition was no old man accompanies you because obviously he'll beat the trick. You know like, we'll beat the system, we'll beat the trick. The thugs of today are beating every system. There's a virus and then there's a counter virus and there's an antivirus and there's another thing just getting on and on and on. So anyway, they laid the whole table out, brought the, the, the groom, the whole family came, they sat down, everybody's hands got long long sticks from, from the elbow coming down. And then they put the most delicious palatable food before them, but now how do you eat? Because you can't bend your hand. So anyway, they brought the old man for safety. They said, you know what, let's just go consult him, we're in a crisis. Now look, this is how they've done here, they've really trapped us. The old man said, it's easy, you take the muscle and then you feed your brother and he feeds you. <laughs> Simple as that. You just got to pick it up and put it in there. So we need the young blood of the youth. They are vigorous, they are dynamic, they are energetic, they are enthusiastic. And we need the maturity of the old, we need the integrity of the old. And we need to put this two together. The Prophet said in the narration is in Tirmidhi, Mamin Shab bin any young man who will respect any old man, any old man because of his age. Any old man because of his age. Allah will appoint the youth of his time when he ages to respect him. I mean, how noble are the teachings of the Prophet This old man was hunched and he was walking. So the youngster made a remark. And he says, Uncle, I like your bow and arrow. Where you got it from? Because his back was, you know, hunched. He says, my son, when you age, you'll get it free. <laughs> you'll get it free. It's part of the package. So anyway, they call Iyas ibn Muawiyah, and Iyas ibn Muawiyah now realizes the volatility, the sensitive nature. Now understand, as I told you, he had excelled in his academics. He was not an ordinary person. And in today's terminology, he had degrees behind his name. He was a profound academic individual. He had a sensitive aspect of religion which is very volatile. That you have the seniority of a noble companion of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And you have hundreds of others on the other side. And he's called to arbitrate in this year. He looks at it, he looks at the heavens, he, he looks at the skies, he glances around. He says, okay, wait. Let me apply my mind. He looks closely to the blessed eyes of Anas radiallahu anhu. نظر إياس إلى أنس بن مالك فإذا شقرة طويلة في حاجبه قد انثنت حتى غدت قبالة عينه فاستأذنه في أدب ومد يده إلى الشقرة فمسحها وسواها ثم قال أترى الهلال أيضا يا صاحب رسول الله. He glances closely to Anas radiallahu anhu. And he finds that there was a white strand of hair blocking his eye and blurring his vision, obscuring his vision. And that was obviously giving him the fake image of a crescent. After all, our people at 100, they can't even see. Here is the man, imagine at the age of 100, he's joining the delegation to sight the moon. That tells you about his, the, his vision. So he realized that there was a white strand of hair. He very politely took his permission and he cleared the white strand of hair. And then he asked Anas, he said, Rasulillah, or oh, the companion of Muhammad Sassim, do you still see the crescent? He said, Kalla wallahi ma ara. Kalla wallahi ma ara. I swear by Allah, I cannot see anything. He says, Alhamdulillah, and everybody understood. And this thing which could lend itself into a dispute was nipped into the bud, was adequately resolved, and in a very mature way was arbitrated because the vision and the integrity of a young boy. So my plea and my concern is, and my hope is, that we can go out in the various spheres of the world and we can enhance the causes in which we enter. We can elevate and promote the people in their respect, those that are anchored in society. 
Respect their seniority. I leave you with the last point. On a legal note, many of us could be perhaps legally inclined. And again, my, 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 my point, what I'm harping on is why we pursue and we have our positive contributions. But let's just not look at everyone, how I can milk him, but how I can really resolve this here. How I can get these two people walking out of my office here, you know what, on, talking, on talking terminologies, and not how one can sue the other and, and draw from the other. There was a person in Kufa, kind of in Kufa, the Rajulun Yulhiru Lil Nasi As Salah, wa Yubdi Lahum Al Wara Al Tuqa. He used to give up the image of piety. Now, let me say at the onset, perhaps you will agree with me, I love the pious, and I guess you also love the pious. And we equally love those who aspire to be pious. But I'm sure you will echo my sentiments. I have a major problem with someone who's not pious and who doesn't intend to become pious but acts pious. I think we need to draw a clear distinction. Someone who's not pious, who doesn't intend becoming pious, noble, reformed, but he gives off an image. In English, there's a beautiful saying. I love people who openly hate me, but I hate people who pretend to love me. I love people. It's a democratic right, my friend, to hate me. You can have an empty me, really empty me. No problem. Put banners and placards and go for it. It's a free world. I love people who openly hate me, but I hate people who pretend to love me. And I'm afraid we've entered into an era of hypocrisy. You've got to watch close. Your brothers also, are they literally your brothers? I mean, the Quran draws an analogy of the Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, alayhi salatu min Allahi wa taslimal. And my research suggests to me every divine scripture spoke about the Prophet Yusuf and Jacob, his father, and his fellow brothers. The brothers, because of their jealousy, because of their jealousy, they plotted the assassination of Yusuf. And I often say, there are three conditions which will snatch your intellect from you. There are three situations where you lose your sanity. One is when you become jealous for a person. Now you become so passionate to harm that person that color can't come in your way, religion doesn't come in your way, the blood doesn't come in your way. You just have this aggression and this passion to harm. You lose your sanity. Jealousy. Analyze the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law debate. At its core, it's jealousy. And the, the, the key factor of this year, I, I read the other day this book, I was in a bookshop and it caught my eye. Statistics on mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. Wow! I said, is it so serious that people can write books about it? One is when you are jealous. Number two, lust. When lust kicks in, then your sanity kicks out. When lust kicks in, when a person is moving around with overwhelming lust, passion, then he's no different than a vulture. He's no different than a Then he is going to pounce. Whether someone is provocative or not, I'm afraid the honor of no woman is safe, the integrity of no woman is safe. Why? Because lust. You know the Urdu poet says it? Like insane people, these lustful humans roam the streets. Like insane people, these lustful people roam the streets. This error has become helpless and has become meaningless. And the Arabic poet said, The, the root cause of every sin is the abuse of the sight. And it takes a spark to ignite a fire. It takes a spark to ignite a fire. كل الحوادث مبدأها من النقل. Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah said, عفوا تعفوا نساءكم في المحرمي 
وتجنبوا ما لا يليق بمسلم إن الزنا دين فإن أقرضته كان الزنا من أهل بيتك فأعلمي He said abstain from casting a lustful glance on a strange woman and divinely almighty will save God your woman folk from the nasty glances of strange men and for heaven's sake do not commit any action which compromises the identity and compromises the profile of a believer do things which are in harmony with your honor the great Mufti Taqi Uthmani will renounce scholar he has said Muslims are morally, religiously, Islamically, ethically bound to respect the laws of their land. If they commit anything against the law of the land, then this is just not an offense against your state, but it's an offense against your faith as well. Because you are morally bound to respect the law of the land. So that traffic light has been synchronized to maintain a flow in traffic. You are ethically, morally, religiously, Islamically bound. وَتَجَنَّبُوا مَا لَا يَلِيقُ بِمُسْلِمٍ إِنَّ الزِّنَا دَيْنٌ He said, fornication is a liability, it's a debt. If you fornicate, like when you borrow money, you have to pay back. When you fornicate, then you prepare your own woman to be fornicated with. You're throwing them out. You are making them susceptible. So I'm afraid that is the, 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 the crisis, you know, that we are facing. So hypocrisy has become very, very common. You really cannot. Coming back to the incident of the Prophet Yusuf ﷺ. When his brothers plotted, and that's what I mentioned, two things I mentioned. One was jealousy, one was lust, and the third is anger. But anger takes control. In English they say, he who angers you, conquers you. He who angers you, he conquers you. He's taken control over the situation. Now there's not two humans talking there, complete. There's mess, there's havoc. Tempers are flaring, divorces are being thrown at, vulgar is being thrown at. And it's just one vicious circle. He who angers you, conquers you. You know, there's an incident mentioned of a person, he walks out. And true patience is where you suppress yourself at a time where you can vent it. That is true patience. This person went into the restaurant. And he parked his horse outside there, and when he came out there, somebody had painted him. So he was enraged and he's upset. And he walks into the restaurant and says, Who painted my horse? And the strong, broad shoulders, robust, tough looking character walks out. And he says, I painted it. You have a problem? He says, Sir, the first coat is dry, you can paint the next coat. <laughs> that his horse is standing on three legs. One leg has been severed. So he asks his friend, he asks his servant, he says, who's done this? He said, I have done it. Why? To provoke you. Oof. Imagine your son punches your diet. And you ask him why? He said, because I feel like for the fun, for the buzz, for the kick, for the thrill. So he walks out and the slave provokes him to the maximum. He says, why have you severed the leg? If I'm not doing it. <laughs> he says, okay. Now when you've got control over the situation, when you've got control over the situation, he says, okay, no problem. You know what you do? I'm not going to upset you, but I'm going to upset the person who provoked you to upset me, and that's the devil. I don't upset you, but what I want to do is upset the one who provoked you. Let me take control, slaughter this animal, Distribute the meat and I liberate you for the pleasure of the Almighty so that the devil must put his head down in shame and cry. He must walk out of your embarrassed and me and you must walk out as brothers. Can we have that, my brother? That we walk out as brothers and the devil puts his head between his legs and he walks out. Muhammad bin Idris al Shafi'i said, Man nala minni aw alibtu bi dhimmatihi abra'atuhu lillahi shakiran minnata. He said, Anyone who has insulted me or offended me or verbally abused me, I have pardoned him out of the countless bounties of my Lord upon me. Many times you will find when you enter into an argument and you are about in the throats of one another, then your dad walks in. 
and said, you know, just look at my face and forgive him. Just look at my face and forgive him. Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi says, I look at the bounties of the Almighty and I forgive everyone. Then he goes on and these couplets make me cry. He said, I cannot bear the burden of knowing that a Muslim's entry into paradise is suspended because I haven't pardoned him. That is too weighty for my shoulders. To know this man is held and suspended at the door of entry subject to someone's pardon. If that man pardons, he can go in. I don't want to carry that on my shoulders. If he doesn't go in there for something else, but not for me. Then he says, Oh, al Asuhu Muhammadan fi ummatihi. The minimum harm of me not forgiving anyone is causing her pain to the heart of my Prophet. And that is enough for me to forgive him. If I haven't pardoned anyone, I know my Nabi's heart is sad with me. And that is enough for me to forgive him. Same thing, forgive everyone, inshallah. An ummah that could be billion in number has fragmented into billion segments because we cannot look beyond our petty differences. So Yusuf, the Prophet Yusuf, his brothers plot to kill him. And then things change, I mean, everything is in the control of the Almighty. You know? The Urdu poet says it and it comes to mind again. It's a long couplet, I'll just share a bit of it. He says, We're living in a new world. It's a new ocean, it's new waves, it's new, it's new lovers and new beloveds. Nayi rahe, naya rehbar, nayi moje, naya sahil. It's a new shore, it's a new ocean. Magar in me koi cheez piyar ke taabil nahi milti, purani raah kya chuti ke abtak manzil nahi milti. But as much as you progress and you advance, I'm afraid it's not enviable because as you're advancing, you're losing your legacy on the way that till today you're bickering with one another. Hence, we cannot stretch an envious eye to your growth. I told you typically on Facebook now. You're still looking for your direction. I'm digressing and I know I have overstepped my mark by far. But I hope I can tie up the incident of Yusuf and not digress from it now. The brothers plotted his assassination. Things changed. And he assumed the position and is now the throne. Ideal time for him to abuse, exploit and milk his brothers. The Quran in its most eloquent verses in the 13th Jews opens up the discussion and says, Yusuf has changed. He's sitting on the throne. They thought the chapter is closed and he's gone. <laughs> sitting on his throne, he identifies every brother of his. These were the very ones that once upon a time they wanted to drop me in the well. I mean, what a point of authority where he could abuse it and he had no seniority over him as far as humans were concerned. But he takes the broad shoulders of a prophet, and he takes the compassion of a prophet, and he takes the integrity of a Nabi. What does he say? <laughs> he tells those working with him, he says, look at these boys that have lined up, don't speak to them. Obviously there was drought and famine, so they came for corn and grain. He says, give them the corn and grain, take their money, and before they leave, slip it back into their saddlebag. We will say, take money, what he gives you, and put it out of his pocket also. In that particular position where he could take revenge, but what did he say? How can I milk my brothers? So I was saying, those were the three incidents where you lose your sanity. Lust, and that's the dominant factor for you, lust. The second is greed, and the second is anger, and the third is jealousy. May the Almighty save us from all. I wrap up with an incident of Iyaz bin Muhammad and I tie it up with my sentiments. What did I say? person who openly hates you is not a problem, but we hate people who pretend to love. And from them we spoke about hypocrisy. So anyway, there was a person in Kufa there. He used to claim piety, holier than thou attitude, holier than thou. And that's something we really need to do away with. We need to really get away with it. So people used to come and need money by him. So one day one person came to him and said, 
him and says, you know what, I've got this money, can I give it with you? He says, no problem, my brother, it's in good hands. I'll take care of it. He takes the money, he goes away. Sometime later, the man needs his money, he says, you know what, I left my money with you, I need it. He says, forget about it, close it off, you'll never get it back. So this young man said, now, now today, how many people are there who have been robbed by the system? And then when you go and go to a lawyer, he says, you know what, this is my problem. Well, let me just tell you, your legal fees will be so much that you decide if you want to pursue the case. Now the poor man needs his 5,000 pounds. The case is going to cost him 4,000. The time, the effort, the ability, it, 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 it just doesn't break even for him. So he decided, he went to Iyas in Nemoavia, this young boy. He says, you know what, I've got a problem. Young, young boy. But, but what was his vision? This man, I borrowed him, I gave him my money, he claimed to be pious. When it's time to collect my money, he declines and he refuses. He asked him, Muhammad, I asked him one question. He said, Ahalima sahibuka anna katuribu an ta'atiyani. Does this alleged so-called pious man, does he know you, you, you intend coming to me and reporting to me? He said, no, he doesn't know anything. He says, okay, if he doesn't know, that's all, no problem. Go. Wafrudi ilayya ghadan, you come to me tomorrow. When this young man left, He's worried, he doesn't even really get his money. In the interim, he sent a message to the so-called pious man. He says, call this pious man here. When your intention is to help, then the Almighty will inspire you accordingly. And when your intention is to cheat, then the devil will whisper you accordingly. It depends what, what does the Quran say? The opening verses. Allah says, by the night, by the, by the night when it darkens, by the day when it brightens, and by the creation of man and woman, in the sa'yakum lashatta, as the sun rises every morning, indeed your endeavors are diverse. Every man is standing at the bus stop to catch a bus or to catch a coach and go to work with a different agenda. Then the Quran elaborates on those whose agendas are noble and those whose agendas are evil. But the Quran makes a clear distinction in Nasa'yakum Nashatta, your endeavors are diverse. You're starting off on different notes. You're starting off on different platforms. So anyway, he sent a message, he said, bring that man here. That man came here. He said, listen, my brother, I heard you very pious man. He says, yeah, you know, I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. Today, unfortunately, we, we, we love just taking undue praise. Somebody tells you, you're a fool, you're a monkey. My friend, if you call me a fool, it doesn't change the reality. I don't become a fool if you call me a fool. Okay? And the next day, subhanAllah, he had a long thobe and he had a flowing beard and he was looking like, you know what, brother, you look like a mufti. Thanks, it's all from the Almighty. <laughs> you're looking like an angel. Make God, Allah accepts you. <laughs> How about yesterday when I told you a fool, you didn't become a fool? But when the praise suited you, then suddenly, you know what, it became. I mean, have we become so desperate? Look at the verses of the Quran. And one is, let me look from his eye and say, how can I arbitrate this thing 
if, if we can settle it outside God and the boat can walk out united and they save their money, the Almighty is happy. When He is happy, the Almighty will give me blessings. When He give me blessings, I'll see prosperity in my family. When I see prosperity in my family, I'll be happy to go home and sit with my children. Otherwise, I will make money and the bills will go. We thought we'll have less children, so we don't have to earn more. Today, one average father spends more on the orthodontics of his child than previously a father had to spend on five children. And the teeth are still not straight. <laughs> you, you look at it. This cover, that cover, this insurance, that insurance, in the event of this, in the unlikely event of this, God forbid, this, that. He said, no problem, do me a favor. Tomorrow, Akhadir Mahaka Hammani. Tomorrow you bring a whole group of people. Because I got a lot of money and I need to give it to you. And you're the only person. So this man is all excited. You know what? This is my chance. This man is trusting me. He's going to give me so much money. He is all excited. Look at the wisdom and the vision. He goes home, prepares a place, gets five people around him. In the interim, the man who's crying for his money comes. Says, You told me to come back the next day. It's the next day I've come here. So, all right, now very simple. You just go to that same man, the so-called pious man, and you tell him, you know what, Ifa ilayya money, give me my money. And if he refuses, then tell him I'm going to report you to Iyas. That's all. Nothing else. You go back to him and say, you know what, my brother, I want my money. In all likelihood, he will refuse. When he refuses, then you tell him, hey, you know what, I'm going to report you to that Iyas. That's all. He says, okay, no problem. He goes back to him and says, my brother, my money. He says, forget about it. So I forget about it, I'm going to Iyas. Fadamma Sami Adalik, when he heard Iyas, he said, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Myself and Iyas go back many years. <laughs> you know what? It's in the family. I don't want to spoil the relationship. Come here, come here, my brother. Come here, come here, come here. No, 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 no. Tell them that I'm going to the media. Tell him I'll put it on the radio station. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Dafa'a ilayhi al maal wa tayyya wa khatira. He said, here's all your money and forgive me for prolonging here's extra money. Subhanallah. <laughs> just, just look at coming out in the world to make a difference with your degree as an academic person but contributing constructively anyway he takes the money this man is under the impression no problem let me lose this 5,000 pounds tomorrow I'm getting 25,000 so it's not a problem he's dreaming <laughs> next thing he comes he has saying you've still got guts to come here obviously there was a trick we played on you to get that man's money out of you now you won't get a dime and you won't get a cent or a penny from anyone. That's the end and you will never ever get a cent. In a nutshell, I have actually summarized the life of this person. But I truly believe his life epitomizes. It epitomizes the spirit of a believer on an academic front, on a spiritual front, on all fronts, how he constructively contributed to society, how he elevated the course, how he integrated the juniors with the seniors, how he maturely spoke to his fellow non-Muslim colleagues with respect and dignity and he could live and study and become a, such an asset that decades and centuries down the line you and I are proud of the legacy that he has left behind. We hope and we pray that this institution can create amongst itself the likes of Iyas. I conclude on this note. Ideally my brother become an ambassador to Islam. But if you cannot become an ambassador, for heaven's sake, don't become an obstacle to Islam. Wa akhiru ta'ala wa akhiru ta'ala. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Takbir! Allahu Akbar!
simply because they would ask the questions that uh, the companions out of respect would not ask and it would provide them with the platform to learn. I hope I can be brief. I had a long flight and I'm relatively tired and exhausted, but I will try my level best to be prompt and to be apt to the point. Uh, this is sister here that says, a few years ago, I stood by in the same room as my friend while she had an abortion. Uh, my religion Islam is something I don't really practice, but just carry as a name. But now I can't stop thinking about that day. I was part of, a, of, the, of the killing of an innocent child. How can I correct, correct this? Firstly, sister, I uh, compliment you for your courage, and I thank you for expressing your sentiments. That indeed is a sign of a believer. The Prophet sallallahu said, when your good deeds please you and your bad deeds hurt you, then you are a believer. So congratulations on this particular teaching of the Prophet ﷺ and his declaration that is a sign you have Iman. So that's the positive side of it. With regards to how can I rectify it, sister, there is a hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, it outlines perfectly well your question. The Prophet says, when any wrong or vice or sin happens on the earth, he or she who witnesses the vice but dislikes the vice, expresses dislike towards it, it is as if they were absent to the wrong. Man shahidaha So they physically see it, but they dislike it. On the reverse, woman ghaba anha. Those who were absent when it happened, but they were told about the particular wrong, and they approved of it, they rejoiced of it, that they will have a share in that sin. So they will be guilty of that wrong simply because they condoned it, they approved it, they promoted it. So, as long as you detest it, my sister, and you regret it, and you repent for it, because undoubtedly observing a crime and witnessing a crime is a crime itself. The Quran very emphatically says, at all times be a source of helping in good, and don't ever support an evil cause. Don't ever support an evil cause. So what I do suggest to you, sister, is that you continuously repent for your wrong. You continuously repent for your wrong. There is a beautiful incident. I don't have time. A person by the name of Sa'id ibn Amir, he says, prior to my conversion to Islam, I witnessed the execution of Khubayr ibn Ali. Khubayr radiallahu was a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu and I always think of that day prior to me accepting Islam when a person was killed in front of me and I rejoiced over his execution. He says that this gives me nightmares in my life and it haunts me and it bothers me that when I stand before Allah and the Almighty will say you rejoice over the execution of a believer, how would I answer? Knowing very well at that time he was not a Muslim, so we would argue that it's justifiable for him to rejoice. But be it as it may, it, it, it haunted him. So it's good that it haunts your sister. And I don't mean that you mustn't move on with your life. But if the haunting can constantly remind you to repent, and that's the spirit of a believer, the more it reminds you, the more you repent, the greater the benefit. And it is for such people, the Quran says, That Allah says, we will turn the evil into good. And Ibn Kathir has written in his commentary, what does this mean? That those who every time they reflect over their wrong, they repent. So every reflection of the wrong is a renewal, is, is, is renewing their loyalty and their repentance. So in other words, reflection of the wrong is bringing them closer to the Almighty. There's nothing physically that you can do, sister. But what you can do is repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I said, take solace from two. The fact that it wants you, that's a sign of iman. Number two. Try and, and, and detest it, disapprove it, stop others from it, inshallah Allah will forgive you. Second question, I, I know that was a bit of a long answer. Can I have the best possible advice regarding the process of finding a spouse? Well, the first advice is don't go online. <laughs> I'll be honest, don't go online. That's my first advice to you. Uh, 
azdiwaj.com, shadi.com, and the rest of it. I promise you, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really not one. The simple procedure of the Prophet ﷺ, my sister or her brother, I don't know if it's a sister, sister or a brother, whoever you are. Marriage is not something where you market yourself. You don't market yourself, you don't promote yourself, any particular woman, where you go and offer yourself to others. Welcome to the Muhammad Sahib. It's not something where you go and throw yourself and promote yourself and degrade yourself. Obviously the correct proceedings in Islam is, like anything else, while we've been exhorted to hasten in marriage, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu said, لَوْ لَمْ يَبْقَ مِنْ أَجْرِ إِلَّا ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامُ وَلِطُولٌ عَلَى النِّكَاحِ لَتَزَوَّجْهُ كَرَانِيَةَ أَنْ أَلْقَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَزَبَا If I had no more than three days left in my life and I was to die after three days, I would hasten in getting married simply because I do not want to meet my Allah single. The correct procedure, sister, like anything else is that obviously you engage in dua, you pray to the Almighty and you you, you know what? You do not market yourself, but via the men folk, it's totally permissible to pass the word around. It's not an offense to say that there is a sister in our family. The beautiful incident in Bukhari of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, when his daughter Hafsa radiallahu anha was widowed, and then he went and he presented his daughter. And there's absolutely nothing but indignity and respect. Unlike when many times we make our sister attend a function, where it will be frequented by men and we ask her to parade the halls and the walls so that all Lucas can glance at her and perhaps be inclined. That's degrading the honor and the respect of any woman. But to say that, you know what, there's a sister here, there's a brother in this family here, if you know of anyone, please let me know. Uh, in a manner that it conforms with Sharia, that that is totally permissible. I mentioned the incident that uh, when Sayyidina Umar's daughter, Hafsa radiallahu anha, was widowed. Then he took his daughter, and he, he, not her physically, but he took the proposal to Abu Bakr, and he as the father initiated it, and he says, you know what, my daughter has been widowed, if you are interested. And he went to Uthman radiallahu anhu, and I just came across a very beautiful narration about the fact when he went to Uthman, and Uthman radiallahu anhu declined. So, you know, he wasn't very clear, he was a bit vague. So, Umar radiallahu anhu then went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, you know what, I presented my daughter as a proposal to Uthman, but he didn't give a clear yes, he didn't give a clear no, no, and that makes me uncomfortable. And subhanAllah, what were the words of the Prophet He said, He said, nothing to fear, Allah will give your daughter someone better than Uthman and Allah will give Uthman someone better than your daughter. And history is testimony to the fact that Uthman was married to the daughter of the Prophet There are very beautiful couplets about that when he was sitting with his wife Ruqayya and someone made the remark and said, Abshir, faqad hunyita thalatam mitra, thumma thalatam wa thalatam ukhra. ثم بأخرى لكي تتم عشرة لقيت خيرا ووقيت شرا نكحت والله حصانا زرا وأنت بكر ولقيت بكرا. It's a topic of its own to explore. So it's not wrong. It's not wrong for you to mention. Shuaib alayhi salam the Quran says he initiated it. When the daughter seen the loyalty of Sayyidina Musa and someone said why don't you employ his skills and the father said why employ my new son-in-law. So the father initiated it and he said. إِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ مُنْكِحَ كَرِحَةَ بِنَتَيَّ هَاتَيْنِ In a nutshell, you may go out of Almighty Allah, you do not project yourself, you do not promote yourself at locations where you assume that people would look at you and thereby be attracted and inclined to you, that's degrading yourself. Do not market yourself. As I told you, the first thing, don't go on to this aziwaj.com and all those other illegal avenues because I'm afraid the reality of life is today, as I mentioned and I indicated in my talk earlier, it's become very hypocritical. So we're giving off an image, we're giving off an image, and obviously the bubble bursts one day, and then you meet the person quite different in relation to what you thought. You recite the relevant to us, and those in your family can definitely circulate the, the words. Okay, uh, 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dear Chef, often a person in our shoes is blessed by many bounties of the Almighty, yet he never benefits himself or others due to a disease that can be summed up as laziness. What advice do you give him? If you study the, the du'as of the Prophet وسلم, on occasion of Arafat, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasli wa'udhu bika min ghadabat al-dayn wa qadhi al-rijal The most comprehensive du'a of the Prophet وسلم, Oh Allah, I ask you protection divinely from feebleness, from laziness, from weakness, from inactiveness. The Prophet ﷺ was a very active man. The Prophet ﷺ was a very strong man. I was just reading the famous narration on the occasion of Badr when the Prophet ﷺ had allocated one camel to three people as they were rotating it. And when the Prophet ﷺ was Abu Nubaba as well as Ali and him. So three of them would rotate. So one would ride, two would walk, and then he could alternate like this here. When it was time for the Prophet to dismount and walk, then the Sahaba would obviously be overpowered and overcome by shame and they would feel uncomfortable. And they would say, Oh Prophet of Allah, that feet ya Rasulullah. Oh Prophet of Allah, you know what? Just just remain mount, mounted and, and we'll do it. We'll be fine with walking. The Prophet said two things. Ma antuma bi aqwa minni. Firstly, you're not stronger than me. You're not stronger than me. Now we look at those words, a dual dimension. On a physical note, we can go for it. You, you, you're no stronger than me. And I am not less in need of reward than you are. SubhanAllah. In two words, as you need reward, so do I need it. And if you think you can walk, so can I walk. Many generations used to walk so swiftly, others were running. So laziness, obviously, you know what, like in medical terminology, they say there's no quick fix. You gotta admit, you gotta take blood samples, you gotta send it to the laboratory, you gotta work on yourself, and then when we get the results are positive from them, we take step two. But there is nothing definite that I say do this here. Obviously, we've been taught in the hadith, and this might be a starting point to the brother or sister who ever sent this here. The Prophet says in this hadith comes to mind now that when a person awakens in the morning, he has three knocks. Famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ says, if he awakens, now reflect over this word, especially the person who sent this question. The Prophet ﷺ says, if he, if he recites the relevant dua, then he performs the ablution and he performs his salah, asbaha nashitan nafs. These are the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, this person will be active, he'll be vibrant, and he will be constructive the whole day. Asbahan nashif al nafs. And on the reverse, the Prophet says, if he does not recite the relevant du'as, and the devil tells him and injects to him, alayka laylun tawil farqud, sleep, the night is young, enjoy it still. And till the sun has risen and he awakens late, asbaha kaslan khabith al nafs. The Prophet says, this man will be lazy, he will be feeble, he will be inactive whole day. Now here we have a clear cut, a clear cut formula from the Prophet وسلم, that if we adequately read the relevant du'as that have been prescribed and we awaken. I mean the Prophet وسلم, has made du'a, Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. Oh Allah bless the mornings of my ummah. So whatever you can accomplish in the morning is something you will not accomplish later and this is no travel early morning and see how quick. The spring you love, how quickly you cover your distance. Why? Because it's the dwell of the Prophet and let noon set in and let it be afternoon and eat and you know there's so many other issues. So on a practical note, brother or sister, whoever you are, let us commence with our foot of salah promptly, inshallah, and there onwards, hopefully, as the words of the Prophet, Kasla, Khabith and Nafs and Nasheed. Nasheed means healthy, active. What is your advice for one hoping to leave Facebook? Leave it. <laughs> that, that's just on the light to know. Obviously, I understand the question is how do I leave it? The Prophet said, When somebody tells you that a mountain has moved, tell him I believe you. And somebody comes and tells you that he has abandoned an evil practice, tell him I don't believe you. The abandoning of an evil practice is more difficult than the moving of a mountain. 
That is why we say, put good qualities into yourself, put good discipline into yourself. You know that youngster said, I was reading the arms of cigarette. It was so bad, I had to give up reading. I didn't give up cigarettes, I gave up reading. Why? Because I couldn't give up abandoning cigarettes. I said, let me not read the literature and harm myself. You monitor your sugar and then you start going on a diet and then you say, this is bad. Stop monitoring it so I can eat. That's just appeasing yourself psychologically. These are the challenges with which we contend. I'm not very prompt with answering my emails, but a day won't go by where I would not receive an email with regards to Facebook. As I mentioned, 8.5 million unique users. These are the challenges. And the other day a sister emailed me, you know, now this is what made up, sending uh, emails to females. That's become the norm. And what did she say? She says, you know what, I want to use it as a platform of da'wah. A platform of conversing and expounding on the beauty of Islam. Well, you know, somebody said it, you can't sit by fire and not get burnt. Maybe, you, you, you know, you, 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 you cannot avoid the heat. Perhaps you will save yourself from the flame, but inevitably the heat is going to, uh, you know, catch up with you. So a person might start on a noble action, but ultimately it's going to lead to something sinful. How do you stop it, sisters, sister or brother, whoever it is? We learn from the hadith that when there is an environment where we are sinning, then we should look towards relocating or adjusting or changing something where we know we are more vulnerable and we're more susceptible. The famous hadith where the person killed 100 people and uh, uh, he killed, he went to someone and he said, How, what should I do? He said, In tariq ila ardi kada wa kada, fa inna fiha unasun ya'budun Allah fa abudillah ma'ud. That you know what, you go to that locality, there are pious people, they go sit with them and go worship Allah with them. So move away. On a practical note, if you can, like someone suggested, your computer, put it in a kitchen. It sounds odd, but don't keep it, you know, covered in your room next to your cupboard where you can off the lights and close the door and have a sign there, don't enter, and then you log on. Expose it in the house. Expose it in the house where you make it difficult for yourself to do something unethical, where everybody has a gaze on you, and that's pro provided you are sincere in your intention, you'll go to any level. Otherwise, otherwise you're going to just find yourself being drawn. You're going to find yourself being attracted. Every day your hand is just going to automatically move towards that device and you're going to log on and you will be chatting and you will be destroying it. If you cannot get rid of it totally due to work related issues, then put it like I said in the central point of the house where it's quite noticeable to everyone. That's on a practical measure. But abandoning of wrong is definitely not a simple thing as I mentioned from the hadith of the Prophet So again, it's not a quick fix but we've got to work at it. Uh, diligently and hopefully, inshallah, that uh, would achieve something. I'm naturally very bad tempered, become angry very quickly. How do I control myself? Subhanallah. Imam Shafi rahimahullah said, Man is turdiba falam yalba fa huwa himar. Wa man is turdiya falam yalba fa huwa shaytan. He said, Anyone provoked and he doesn't become angry is a donkey. And anyone who becomes upset and people ask him to forgive and he doesn't forgive is the devil. So what I am saying is, just to outline it briefly, to react by provocations is pretty much normal. That is why somebody to ask the person for advice. So he said, what? He says, give me advice. The advice was given, don't become angry. He says, but I don't become angry, others make me angry. I'm never angry, it's other people. So he said, okay, let me rephrase my advice. When you become angry, look after your tongue and your hands. If you can take control of your tongue and your hands, then you have taken control of the situation. In Tabiul Ghafirin, there is a quotation, it is mentioned, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yabna Adam, uzkurni hina tabda, azkuruka hina abda. Oh my servant, when you are enraged and you provoke and you become angry, then remember me and I will remember you on the day of Qiyamah when I am angry. Just look at the, the reward for it. In fact, we all want the damsels of paradise and the Prophet says the dowry for the damsels of paradise is controlling your anger. How do you calm down your anger? You know. 
You know when you're going to be provoked into a situation and you can foresee yourself going, then walk off. There is an incident mentioned with Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhu had an argument. Ali radiallahu anhu went away to the masjid and he slept in the courtyard. And that was the time when the Prophet came and he asked Fatima, where is Ali? And she said, he's gone to the courtyard. And again, the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu he realized he's sensitive, he didn't get upset. And what you do to my daughter? And you know what? I don't just give my daughter. No, no. The Prophet sallallahu with his wisdom and his maturity, the scholars say he broke, he broke the ice with some, uh, you know, lightheartedness. And he said, Ya Aba Tura, oh Ali, you're looking very dusty today because there was dust on him. And Ali used to often say, when someone calls me dusty man, that title is more beloved to me than calling me Ali, simply because dusty man was a title given to me by the Prophet The point that I deduce from the equation is that in an argument, walk away. Let the person call you, you know what, you're not a man, you can't stand up, and you know what, you're running away. That's a lighter thing, that's a lighter thing. Because you know you cannot control yourself, it is lighter for you to excuse yourself uh, than, than sitting there and then being provoked and not responding. Then so just take a simple thing, if a person is flapping his hands, a simple analogy, a person is flapping his hands, if you move your hand out, it's going to flap harder, louder, nothing's going to happen, there's no sound. But no, no sooner you resist the flap, and there's contact, it gets louder and louder. The more you resist it, the more he's hit it, it becomes ugly and it becomes, it can explode. So I mean, whoever the brother or sister is, walk away from the situation. Uh, anger is a, is a very serious thing, as I briefly indicated in my lecture. There's an incident of a person that is mentioned in the books of Sira, Abdullah bin Khattal, that he, the Prophet ﷺ, had deputed him to go and collect some zakat, and with him the Prophet ﷺ had sent another slave. And when they got to the location where he was going to collect the revenue and the zakat, he told the slave to prepare the food and I'll collect the food. In the interim, the youngster fell off to sleep. When he came back, he was extremely hungry. And obviously, a hungry man is an angry man. So he was provoked even more. And in the fit of anger, he killed this young boy. Simply because the food was not prepared. When a person is hungry, obviously, he loses his balance. He killed that person. When he killed the person, he realized there's going to be great consequences against me that I have killed him and revenge will be taken from me and my life will be taken. So he decided to abandon his Islam and become renegade. And then he had slave girls, he used to incite them to sing vile poetry, poetry against the Prophet ﷺ. Amongst those who the Prophet ﷺ had issued the command that they be beheaded at the conquest of Makkah due to their horrendous and gruesome crimes, one was this person. But if you trace, the core reason of his crime was anger. So where it ultimately led to the killing of a person because of the extent of anger. And in anger, I mean today, you just read the papers and see road rage accidents. Road rage. And then there is obscene fingers being shown out and his tempers that are flaring and then he presses his horn and you know what, it's such an ugly sight. It's, it's just controlling yourself for 10 seconds and taking control and driving past. But otherwise, if both play up, it becomes very angry. So obviously, it's something you've got to work on, and anger is a serious thing. The Prophet said in the famous hadith, categorizing the humans in four categories with regards to anger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq that we control our anger, and we display it at the right thing. Another thing, we know that obviously, if you sit and you lie down, if you lie, uh, you, you, you should make wudu, and you should move on because uh, it is a flame from hell. Five minutes and we wrap it up. Okay, alhamdulillah. Sorry, apologies if I, I, I haven't completed everyone. If you pray while still having alcohol or drugs in your blood, but yet you are not intoxicated, are your prayers accepted? With regards to the quotation where the Prophet has said that for 40 days your prayers will not be accepted, first thing you must understand as soon as a person repents, as soon as a person repents from the wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving. The, 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 the issue of not accepting is the penalty and is, and is the consequences and the repercussion when you persist on the crime, when you persist on the crime. But no sooner, if you had had this evil happen and you repent and you retract from that wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and we are optimistic. However, we cannot deny the narrations that suggest that a person who does have intoxication and, and alcohol, his prayers will not be accepted for 40 days. The scholars say, if he prays in a clean and a pure condition, meaning on externally there's nothing impure on his body, 
then for that duration he will be absorbed of his responsibility. However, he will have no added reward. He will be absorbed of his responsibility. So in other words, when we go to pray, then obviously it's our duty that we absorb of and we get reward. Such a person will be absorbed of his responsibility, but there will be no added reward for him. But again, if I conclude on an optimistic note, the Quran says, and repeatedly wherever the Almighty speaks of azab and of mercy, that if you repent sincerely, so you don't intend to revert to the practice, then the Almighty will forgive you. Where do you draw the line between avoiding seeking positions and having high zeals to lead, which Islam prompts? I think it's quite clear, you don't go to any length to do anything unlawful. Where do we draw a distinction? Where do we draw the fine line? Where we have noble aspirations and high goals and we excel and we want to excel over others. We want to excel. There's such a noble quotation mentioned that the O's and the Khazras, these were trying that were loggerheads and they had rivalry for decades. And after their reversion and their conversion to Islam, the whole nature of the argument became different. So the host tried and said that you know what, Minna man ujizat shahadatuhu bi shahadati rajulain. Minna man ihtasadahul arz, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az. That uh, now they started arguing and said, you know what, we that is the host tribe, we are better than you. Like we heard about the brothers who buy and competing in collecting money. That's noble, that's wonderful. Where you have noble aspirations, provided you don't go to the extent to secure it by doing anything wrong. That means if I'm going to take this position, I have to bear mouth someone. I have to do something unethical, I have to do something illegal, then obviously that's the cut-off point. I will not go beyond this year. To the extent, I mean, we've been exhorted to hold the black stone when we, when we perform the circumambulation of the Kaaba. But we've been told if it is stepping over the shoulders of people, then step out. Step out and leave the kissing of the black stone because now respecting the, the sanctity of the Kaaba and then respecting the rights of those that are performing the circumambulation is equally vital. So we don't want to get there at the cost of hurting anyone. So climb the ladder, but not at the cost of tramping anyone. So anyway, the old strife, they boast about, you know what, prior to Islam, they were rival. And after Islam, they boasted that we have that companion on whose death, even the throne of the Almighty came into motion. We have that companion whose evidence is equal to two, which the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned. And they go on mentioning their virtues. And then the, 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 the Khazraj tribe responds by saying, Minna rabba'atun jama'u al-Qur'an. And we have four people that are exclusive to our class and that are responsible for the compilation of the Qur'an. So a spirit of buying and competing like we heard with regards to the collection drive is phenomenal and brilliant but not at the cost of offending anyone and I think that's where we draw the line. I have a bad habit of swearing, how can I stop it? What the saying goes, he swears like a sailor. But today sometimes if you hear many of this, uh, you know, mechanical engineers, they swear more than swearing the sailors. There is a hadith the Prophet wasallam told the Sahabi, that the subhanna ahad. Do not swear anyone or anything. One person in the time of the Prophet wasallam, he had a fever. And then he said, the silly fever. The silly fever. So the Prophet wasallam said, don't even say a silly fever. The stupid flu. Don't even say that. One person was riding, this is mentioned in one book, he was riding on his camel. And then uh, on his donkey, and the donkey slipped and he fell. So he said, Ta'ni said, Himar. Like you know, he said, the stupid car, the silly car. So he said, this, this silly donkey. So when he said, the silly donkey, the angels started disputing. فَقَالَ صَاحِبُ الْيَمِينَ مَا هِيَ حَسَنَةٌ أَكْتُبُهَا وَقَالَ صَاحِبُ الشِّمَالَ مَا هِيَ سَيِّئَةٌ أَكْتُبُهَا The angel who records good said, well, silly donkey is not a virtuous act that I can record and credit it to his noble deeds. So silly donkey is not equivalent to any noble deed. The angel recording evil said, مَا هِيَ سَيِّئَةٌ أَكْتُبُهَا well, if it's not noble, it's not evil either. Maybe it's unpleasant, but I don't think it constitutes a crime. So I'm not going to record it. For the benefit of the non-Muslims, we believe that uh, whatever good or bad we do is recorded on either shoulders. The, the good on the right and the evil on the left. So anyway, he has uttered a statement and nobody wants to record it and document it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then inspired the angel who records the evil. مَا تَلَكَ صَاحِبُ الْيَمِينِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَاكْتُبُهُ Wherein Allah told the angel that records the evil, that the screening process will be done by the angel who records good. If he doesn't consider it to be good, it goes into evil. If he doesn't consider it to be good, it goes into evil. Now, can you imagine if we have the, the, the vulgar language? Huh? The Prophet was walking and somebody insulted Abu Bakr. 
And Abu Bakr was first silent and he provoked him again and then Abu Bakr responded with abusive uh, you know, language. And he cursed him and he said something unpleasant to him. And subhanAllah, the Prophet's words were unique. He said, La'an was a deep kalla rabbil ka'ba. La'an was a deep kalla rabbil ka'ba. I will wrap up now, inshallah, I know my, I'm cut off. I'll call that a day and we'll end off there. The Prophet sallallahu told Abu Bakr, one side you are noble like Abu Bakr, and one side you curse, these two can't be found in the same human. You, it, it cannot be, it, it, you just can't marry the two, you just can't tie the two. Siddiq wa la'an kalla wa rabbil ka'ba. So one side you're a believer, one side you're a, a religious conscious person, and one side you're using vulgar language and you're using abusive language. It definitely doesn't tie with the profile of a believer. May the Almighty save us from vulgar language. Ya Allah, the Amun Tahullah, wa kulu kawlan sa'ida, wa kulu kili fiyah, the Almighty and Allah, that which is noble. The poet says, Ma in nadim tu ala sukuti marratan, wa laqad nadim tu ala kalabi mirara. After resolving an argument, generally it's human nature after the argument is over and you go back, then you, you dwell over the argument. And you say, now what did he say, what did I say? And you plan your counter defense for the future time. So now you're going to walk past because you want him to provoke you because now you've got the answers prepared. And then you say, hey, but what did he say? Oh, I should have said this, hey, but I should have said this. The poet says, after an argument, I always analyze what I said. And I never regretted when I was silent, and I always regretted when I spoke. Ma in nadim tu ala sukuti marra, wa laqad nadim tu ala kalami mirara. I never regretted why did I, why was I quiet, but I always regretted why I spoke. On those notes, as I've been indicated to wrap up and conclude, and thank the organizers for hosting me in this event. Jazakallah.